May I have an approval of the agenda? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to offer comments from the public. Thank you. Could you go up to the microphone? Thank you. Um, last regular Would meeting. Would you identify yourself first? I'm sorry, please. Jen That's Erickson, okay. Director of Technology, Nantucket Public Schools. Um, at the last meeting, um, Mr. Fox asked <coughs> about having meetings with parents. And I had, at the time, um, forgot to mention that we had had the NIS and CPS orchestrated a, um, a meeting and a um, group of people. We had panelists and everything. It was called Recovering from the Pandemic, Your Child, the Internet, and Developmental Norms. Um, it was held on April 11th. Um, the people that were there, there were representatives from Children's Cove, Suzanne Fransudo from A Safe Place, um, other people from Safe Place, and Kevin Marshall from the Police Department, and myself. And we each spoke about internet safety, that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, there were only a couple of families that came. It was in the NIS cafeteria, um, but it was really, it, it was a very positive experience. Uh, the parent, the people, the families that were there were really impressed with all of the different pieces that we fit together. So I just wanted to refresh everybody's memory as to that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Right? Yes, Mr. Riccio, would you come up to the microphone, please? Sorry, I'm going to make you do that. You look very smart tonight. <laughs> Great. Well, How are you? Good. Good. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members, and Ms. Hallett, I've had the privilege and the pleasure of attending school committee meetings now for well over a decade. Naturally, a, a lot has changed over those years. But there has been one consistency during this period I'd like to single out, and someone who has kept order, structure, adherence, attention to detail at all of these meetings, Ms. Logan O'Connor. There are a host of descriptors we could attribute to her, including intelligence, commitment, involvement, wit, demeanor, willingness, humor, myriad others. The list is endless. So, Ms. O'Connor, I propose we strew as many as these accolades on you, like rose petals forming a vibrant path to your future, wherever <laughs> that may be. You will be sorely, sorely, sorely missed professionally and personally. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you, Mr. Riccio. <laughs> Any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll continue on with the agenda. Superintendent's report. Okay, so good evening, everyone. And my apologies, I am um, going off of notes because I left them on the printer as I normally print out prior. So um, we'll start with the end of year celebrations and our graduation. On um, June 11th, we graduated 131 um, students from the class of 2022, and um, they are really a wonderful class, and I know that um, they will go down in our memory. Um, myself, Mrs. Vassals, the high school, um, um, the, hi the high school teachers as a, a class of really special students. Um, I mentioned in my graduation remarks, resilience, advocacy and unity, which I saw as, um, as characteristics of this class. It was really lovely to hear some of the other folks um, speak at graduation. We had Kate Barney, who was our, um, our um, keynote speaker. She is uh, in human resources at TikTok, and I think she really spoke to the students on a more personal level. Not only was there a TikTok created with the students at uh, graduation, but also um, she did speak to them about finding their passions and going with them and um, um, continuing to take care of themselves through their journey, which I thought was really special. Um, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a great day. We were lucky. The weather was, was good, and it was certainly a, um, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, other celebrations that have occurred recently, we have the fifth grade celebration, which happened today. 
Um, during the day, we had um, in the morning, there was a lot of outdoor fun had by the fifth graders with their teachers, and then a potluck, potluck lunch, and I think it was very successful. So um, we have the eighth grade celebration coming up on June 23rd, and um, we look forward to seeing them um, pass uh, to the high school. Um, we did have jump up days recently, which was really uh, very successful, and um, I think that each grade moving to the new school that they are coming to um, felt better having had a chance to um, ex experience some face time with their teachers and to have a schedule in hand in some cases at the high school, um, and I think that that was a helpful opportunity for them. Um, we look forward to other celebrations and, and our final day on June 23rd, so um, definitely some, some enjoyable things happening. Hiring update. So we have filled 30 of our 46 open positions. Um, we are still struggling with some of the more challenging positions to fill. Those are um, high school math, um, uh, middle school science. We are also struggling to fill our social work positions, our school psychology positions, and our TAs. So um, we do have advertising that has gone out and is um, in the inquiry mirror, but also um, in different websites that you've heard me speak about at other school committee meetings. Indeed, um, School Spring and um, other um, national and um, Massachusetts uh, teacher association groups, such as MAST, which is for science teachers in Massachusetts, NCTM, which is the national um, for math teachers. So we're, we're pushing out. What I've noticed and heard uh, with, from my colleagues across the state is that they are also struggling to hire. This is a trend that is happening not just here on Nantucket. I want to thank the community for the outpouring of support around housing. Uh, the article that came out in the Inquirer Mirror and The Current have really um, made people uh, think about whether or not they can support and assist with teacher housing. And I am very pleased to have received um, quite a few requests, not requests, but offers. And um, just a reminder, our, our teachers need the housing between August 26th and June 22nd. So it's really helpful to know those dates and make sure I'm, I'm sharing those dates. <clears throat> um, I do want to talk about the calendar, which is on your first page here. Um, we did have a change that uh, wanted we wanted to open for discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's very clearly uh, in June, the last day for pre-K students. Um, and that is going to be on the 15th of June at early release time of 10 a.m. And then the last day of kindergarten, which will also be an early release at 10 a.m. So it is important that we get this in the calendar so that our um, parents and caregivers know fully well when kindergarten and pre-K um, last days are. It will help them to prepare. So. <coughs> so I open it up to the committee for discussion. Let you catch your breath. <laughs> Rocky? Questions? Um, what, were the, what were the prior dates? Um, just one day before. So um, pre-K was planning to end on the 16th of June mm -hmm. and kindergarten on the 20th. Mm -hmm. What is, um, Ms. Kubish, is she okay with those dates? She, um, I spoke with Ms. Ms. Kubish about the dates. Um, at length, and uh, we both agree, and I think the kindergarten and pre-K teams also agree, that the best thing to do is to um, end their time uh, the week before the Juneteenth holiday weekend, because it is um, challenging to come back for one day or two days So all, all the teachers and administration and yourself are all in. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Meralda? Uh, no comment. No questions, thank you. No questions? Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Do you want us to take a vote on that? Uh, that's the next meeting, I believe. Oh, okay, yes, because we're just saying it. Gotcha. No. We can vote this meeting? Okay, when we come to go votes, we can add, we can add the calendar. Thank you. Do you want to keep going? Uh, yeah, do you want to keep, um, <coughs> Beth was continuing on the hiring update. Oh, no, you did. I'm done. So, never mind. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sleeping. I'm, I'm done, but happy That's to right. answer questions. Thank you. All right. Yes. Um, do you want me to continue or do you want to? No, go ahead. Okay. Okay. We're going to start with um, presentations and discussions of um, 
interest, please. Sherry Lewis, I'd like to invite you up. If you would come and talk about the Family Connections Program. And you're joined by Mrs. Gottlieb. I am, yes. Who we only have for a few more weeks, but that's another story. Uh, through the chair. <laughs> yes. Does that microphone work? It does for the television. So it's not for the John Q. public here in the room. I don't believe it. it, it. Okay. Okay, you guys ready? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the Family <laughs> Connections Program um, was an idea that was conceived in the fall of 2021 during a Nantucket Intermediate School um, professional learning community meeting. And um, it was, there was a lot of discussion about how can we support students that were coming up during um, student of concern meetings. So students were identified and invited to participate based on DESA data, their academic performance and their counselor and administrative um, recommendations. So the purpose of the Family Connections Program is to provide academic support, social emotional support, parenting support, um, and family support because siblings from NES are invited to participate as well if they have an older sibling who was selected to participate in the program. And nutritional support was also provided where families could come and get a hot meal. Um, the, uh, Family Connections Program has an interdisciplinary learning concept. Um, parenting classes were also uh, provided for families, for parents to come. We were really thrilled with the parent participation that we had. Uh, and the parenting classes were run by the Family Resource Center, who uh, were struggling to get parents to go to them for their classes, so they came to the school where the parents were. The Family Connections program ran for about seven weeks. We began the program the last week of April and it just ended on June 9th. It's a two hour program that ran one day a week on Thursday evenings. Um, and we had about 20 to 25 students that consistently participated throughout the seven weeks. The funding for this program was provided, I know I have a federal grant up there, 613, but that actually is a state grant that the funding came from. Um, and that grant is surrounded, uh, I'm sorry, is focused on social emotional learning and behavioral health. We have the opportunity to continue the grant for next year through federal funding. And I've gone ahead and I've applied for that grant so that we can continue to run this program. Um, the Family Connections program next year, we're looking to expand it to include NES students who would also be identified based on DESA data, um, as well as NIS students. And of course, uh, families are still going to be invited. So if there are any siblings who are invited to participate, their, um, their younger siblings will also be invited to participate so that the whole family can come and enjoy all of the services of the Family Connections program. Next year, we're hoping to run the program longer because of when the grant money became available this year, we weren't able to start until April and also creating all of these new stipend positions to support the program took some time as well. So now that a lot of these things are in place, we'll be able to start earlier um, and have the program run just a little bit longer. And I just want to say a special thank you to the coordinators who ran this program. Karen Gottlieb is going to talk a little bit about um, some of the community connections that she established to help support the Family Connections Program. We also had um, Jennifer Lewis, who did a lot of networking to get food services provided at um, a pretty reasonable cost. Erin um, Peckham uh, did the social emotional learning work, and then Nasia Smith did a lot of our parent and community outreach. So I'm gonna let uh, Karen speak a little bit about some of the community outreach she did to provide programming. <clears throat> Thank you. So as Sherry said, we had about 20 to 25 students per week would come and participate with us on a Thursday evening. It was wonderful. Um, most of the kids were consistent. And during that two hour block of time, they would have two different activities with a meal in between and the, ro the activities would rotate. Um, what was great is we had a lot of community organizations come in and provide programming. 
the Nantucket Historical Association was consistently working with us, Mariah Mitchell mm -hmm. Association, Sustainable Nantucket, Ella from the Community Garden, um, for example. And they would run a 50-minute, one-hour program with the kids, digging in the garden, um, doing hands-on activities with NHA, um, and bringing the learning components into hands-on activities. Uh, Galen Gardner ran a um, non-competitive games and cooperative learning in the gym. Uh, we had the Dreamland Theater. We had um, Conservation uh, Foundation come in. Um, to do updates with the parents and connect with the kids. Um, so it was a very vibrant and interactive time for the students, and it was a wonderful opportunity, I think, for many of our organizations to come in and connect with students and parents. Um, any questions? Rocky? I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see you all there next year. Ms. Morelda, no any questions. questions? Thank you. Okay. Um, Laura, I'm not letting you off yet. No, que no. no questions, but it sounds vibrant and wonderful. And our, we were very excited to participate as the Dreamland. So it's. Thank um, you. Yeah, you're welcome. So I'm, I'm excited about this program. It's been so well received. And um, thanks. Thank you, Thank very you much. so much. Thank you. Tim? Karen, what is the DESA data? It says um, DESA data, but what? Yes, and, and the DESA is something that I had mentioned at a couple of the other presentations that I've done. Um, it is uh, data that we gather using the system Aperture, and it is basically measuring um, the, <coughs> the different areas of awareness, like um, uh, self-regulation, um, self-awareness, the ability to set goals. And these screenings are done three times a year at um, all of the schools except for the high school where it was done twice, a year, twice this year. Okay. It allows okay. us to measure whether or not the program's successful, and so it, it's great that it's data-driven. I have a question, Sherry. With the parenting education, does that come from a curriculum that you set, or do you also take feedback from from parents, to, you know, in case they're interested in certain subjects or learning about something? Um, it because it was done by the Family Resource Center. It was a set curriculum that they had already established. But in addition to that set curriculum, uh, during like the first part of the night. The parents did the parenting class, and then during the second part of the night, they were made aware of um, some of the organizations that Karen brought in. They were able to learn more about how to engage their um, their children in, like, the Maria Mitchell Foundation and Dreamland and um, things like that. So it was it was informative for the parents as well. So it wasn't just strictly the parenting class. And then they also had the option to talk with one another um, during their meal time that was provided. Was there any um, feedback or a survey done afterwards to get the comments of? Yes, uh, I have that. I actually left it over on the chair. But uh, we did a survey with the parents and the students uh, with five primary questions. And um, we have the results for the state data. But um, we took some of the direct quotes from the students. And there were such things as, uh, what have you gained from this program that you've brought to your home? This is children speaking. I should be reading them from, from my quotes, but some of the standouts were, um, I, I am happy on Thursdays because I'm coming to the program. Um, we had students talk about how they made new friends, and we were able to see that from the evening come into the classroom, where students did make some really nice connections because the groups were small, and we had a great staff child um, numbers. Mm -hmm. the, the groups were small. People got a lot of attention. so the the relationships could really grow, and we saw that transfer into the classroom, and that was that was great to see that happen. Uh, but we did take a survey, both parent and student. Um, as I said, I can we can send that to you if you'd like to. Have I, I'd I'd love yeah. to see it just to to see the feedback. But I, it's wonderful. I'm, I hope it can continue. <coughs> I actually have the document if we want. Um, we'll say that. Okay, we'll send it to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, next is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Team. Marita Scarlett um, and her team will come up. <clears throat> thank you. 
Hi, um, I'm Marita Scarlett. I've served, um, this is my second year serving as the coordinator for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Team. Um, and I have with me Lauren Savarino, Nicole Ridge, and Paige Martineau. Um, and I want to give a thank you to Mandy Bardsley um, and also um, Dr. Tangie Reed Marshall, who I know worked with the school committee and the administration early in the year um, to develop these. Um, which I'm just going to reference for you, the mission and vision and the core values. I know um, you guys are all familiar with them, but we highlighted some keywords that we feel really inform our work as a school district um, in really moving from diversity to inclusion, um, with, of course, you have to stop at equity to get there. Um, so dynamic, equitable, and this idea of each of us being um, inspired leaders. Um, for each and every student. Um, the vision, um, again, these keywords, equitable, inclusive, and challenging. Um, and the idea that all, in, or every, every student and adult feels seen, heard, valued, and respected. Um, the core values, again, I know you guys are familiar with these, so I'm not gonna harp on them, but these keywords, equitable access. Um, and that, this to me really speaks to this idea of the individual pathways that it isn't just one size fits all, um, and so that where whatever a kid's interest or passion is, that we can try to scaffold them to success within that, um, using high expectations and having things be student-centered. Um, and also that we're working to respect and celebrate all cultures. Um, and finally, challenging ourselves um, to embrace and advocate for the needs of everybody, every person. Um, so this is a lofty. Uh, lofty goal, and I'm, I'm proud of the, I was really, really pleased with um, this when this came out of the school committee um, and the school administration in the fall. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it to Nicole. So this is our team's mission that we developed last year, and we're continuing to do some of this work this year. Um, I believe we have a copy of it, so I will not read the whole thing. But I think the most important part is that we're working on what we can do to make it student-centered equity work, as well as being a resource for our colleagues in our buildings, and also the idea of really delving into some of the school processes and procedures to be more inclusive and analyzing some data, which we'll get into even further. Um, <clears throat> so this is the second year of our ILT, um, albeit with some new and different members who have been able to share their unique uh, skill sets and perspectives. Um, this is just kind of an overview of some of the accomplishments that our ILT um, did in the previous school year. Um, in addition to what you see here, uh, we really focused on teaching and learning um, and supporting allyship and our impact that teachers and staff can have in the classroom at that level. Um, and we really served as a sounding board for other staff members if they needed to debrief, debrief something, um, needed some resources, needed to enhance some lessons, needed to really um, know if resources that they were using were the most um, equitable and accessible for all students, um, in addition to what you see here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and that work sort of led us into our work this year and our scope of work. This is, um, was put together in collaboration with um, Dr. Reed Marshall, um, really focusing on, um, <coughs> let me just figure out how I want to say this, sorry. Um, so I think really looking at sort of how things are done um, is really the first thing in figuring out how things maybe should be changed. And so really our scope of work this year was um, looking specifically at um, how kids are assigned to classes, um, patterns of course assignment, um, and we, we wanted to jump into that and we, we couldn't quite do that because we didn't have enough um, data around that information available, so that's, you'll see that that's one of the recommendations we have moving forward. Um, but looking at, um, as we dive into the data, you'll see sort of patterns around um, advanced courses. Um, how does your coursework selection relate to possibly your special education or ESL identification? Um, and really to develop an internal capacity to analyze our own data. I know for me that was a huge learning curve, and so I'm really grateful for this opportunity um, to look at macro level data. As a special educator, I'm kind of like a couple of kids in front of me, and <laughs> that's what I'm focused on. Um, so um, 
that was the scope of our work this year, and that's what we're going to talk to you a little bit about, um, about what we've done and how we got there. Hi, Paige Martineau. I'm, I'm new to the team this year, so I'm talking about this year's accomplishments. Um, I think the, the first thing we jumped right in and facilitated a, an August professional development session in which the district staff was introduced to the mission, the vision, et cetera, which was you know new to all of us. And so um, along with the um, DLT, we helped introduce that and um, got people thinking about you know what we already do. Um, you know, the, what aligns with the vision already, um, you know, what we'd like to try, um, and how we'd like to grow. So we sort of kicked off the, the year thinking in that way. And then as a team, um, as Marita just described, you know, essentially we sort of infused our DEI lens into, um, you know, the school and district committees, and we analyzed um, the data of subgroups. We spent a good deal of meetings on MCAS data, looking at it through an, a, a, a DEI lens. Um, we looked a bit at course enrollments and the district report card. I think, you know, as you'll hear from us um, as the presentation continues, a, a lot of what we <coughs> Um, came up with our, a lot of questions um, that we need to dig into more data to analyze. Um, finally, you know, this was the first year that we observed Juneteenth, um, and so at NES and NIS, um, there was a lot of planning and celebrations um, that occurred that some of our team members put together. I'm still up. <laughs> so I'm going uh, to, I am an English teacher, I, um, so I was chosen to talk a little bit about the, the ELA MCAS data that we, we dug into. There's a lot of jargon on the slide, so uh, I'll just um, sort of spell out a couple of things. You know, so the, the achievement levels on the um, MCAS exam, the next generation, are exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, partially meeting expectations, and not meeting expectations. Um, as you can see, you know, what we came up with is it's actually really no surprise. I mean, we've obviously been analyzing MCAS data as a district for a long time. Um, but we have a lot of students who are in the partially meeting, which, which means that they, the, according to the test, they partially met grade level expectations. Um, and that triggers, um, you know, a, an assessment that, uh, that the uh, school is supposed to do to make sure that, that, you know, the kids who are in that category are getting assistance, um, you know, if there's any additional assistance they need. Um, and, and obviously the same must take place with the not meeting expectations. There are a few exceptions, as you can see in the slide, of, of a couple of grade level years in the data that we looked at. Um, but generally speaking, um, the largest percent of NPS students are partially meeting. And, and that's obviously not good, and that's something that you know, we want to dig into further. Um, another thing that's no surprise, and it's been true since I've been here, 19 years, um, and that is that our constructed responses um, are often the place where we fall down. And, um, and uh, you know, I think that is something that we need to dig into um, a bit more. Um, finally, our L's and our FELs, and again, a little jargon there, L's are English learners and FELs are former English learners. Um, did not meet the expected performance levels, and, and in some grades, it was is pretty stunning um, <coughs> the, those percentages. So uh, we'll talk more about recommendations. So I'll just quickly mention them. Um, but one of the recommendations that we have is is instructional coaches. Um, I know that's been talked about a lot in the district, um, and uh, you know I. I there's a lot of support that can um, get be put into place. You know, as a teacher, I will tell you that the kind of work that needs to be done in terms of really digging into data and then um, talking about instructional strategies that work um, and, um, you know, collecting data on those instructional strategies and whether or not they're effective, um, looking at curriculum, that's a lot of work. Um, and it's just really not possible for a classroom teacher to, um, you know, take that, um, you know, work all on their own. So instructional coaches can be a big part of that. Um, and professional development, 
that's uh, tailored to specific identified areas of need. Again, the constructed response is, um, is a concern. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit to the math. Thank you, Paige, for outlining all the jargon. I appreciate that. Um, similar information here regarding the, um, our subgroups. So overall, our math data is, shows lower achievement than our ELA da data at all grade levels and for all subgroups. Um, across all grade levels, more than 50% of the subgroups, of, of students in all subgroups, are in that, um, that partially mastered or progressing category, um, which is, again, that it was just like our big noticing was that that was such a significant group of kids and really can, how can we figure out, like it could be one question, we just bump them into that meeting. So really looking at um, what are the standards that we're struggling with? What does that look like across, across the grades vertically? Um, if you look at a, a grade of kids going through school, are they all struggling with fractions starting in third grade and they still don't know how to do slope because they don't under, understand fractions in 10th grade? Um, so are these cert certain things that we could really dig into? Um, and similar to with the ELA is it does seem that the constructed response continues to be an area of, of weakness. Um, and also similar to ELA, our former English learners did not meet our ex the expected performance levels either. Um, so really looking at how do we support those subgroups effectively. Um, we know that there was a needs assessment um, for math conducted this year. Um, we recommend that we develop a five-year professional development plan, um, the inclusion of instructional coaches, um, reviewing curriculum for, um, to support more inclusive practices, and again, the writing needs assessment. Just really, we want to be really clear that we're not talking about like a shortcoming of the English teachers or the writing teachers, that it really is constructed response, writing for the purpose of academic writing um, across all content areas, and how do we support, I mean, I remember when I went to, was in school, my math teacher was not teaching me how to write. <laughs> so if you're a math teacher, how do you teach how to write an, a constructed response? Um, and thinking about, you know, again, instructional coaches to support that, um, those practices that would likely be effective for um, every student and across all content areas. Um, and then, as Paige said, collecting the data on what are we doing and is it working? As Marita mentioned, uh, it's similar for myself of a deep dive into this um, MCAS data and thinking about the coursework because I teach English language learners at the elementary school. So it was really great to see this broad <coughs> lens and think about, you know, the whole idea of beginning with the end in mind. What can I do and what can my team do to prepare them for this success while they go to MCAS and make this course selection? So we did a deep dive of the data and it's linked to the coursework. And these are some of our key findings and they're on here on the screen. But as you read over them, please take notice of some of the areas of success where N PS students are comparable to or exceeding that of the state. In the case of um, K-5 to students, 100% of students take art and more NPS students participate in programming than the state of Massachusetts in arts programming. Grade 9 course completion, more students with disabilities passing grade 9 than the state. And then as related to our other previous slides, where can we help our L's, FELs, never L's, and how can we bump those up and what else can we be doing for things of that nature? Uh, so some of our recommendations after um, looking at the coursework, some of the questions that we had were um, the idea of is there room to do a transcript analysis and that was something that um, Dr. Tanji Reed Marshall also brought up with us and what a transcript analysis means is that um, it would be an analysis of completed coursework and course offerings um, taken from a sampling of students. So um, L students, special education students, um, duly identified students, students enrolled in AP classes um, across genders, different minority groups, different grade levels, and kind of looking at um, where, where there are potential inequities um, in, in overall offerings and, and enrollment overall. Um, and then also in <clears throat> consideration of that, um, really looking to address bias, both internal and external. Um, so it's important to consider the conscious and the subconscious bias that students would have with them, within themselves and that teachers would have as well um, in thinking about um, students' cultural uh, and linguistic backgrounds um, as it's influenced by their personal experiences, their experiences with assessment, um, their experiences with um, 
the system overall and um, just how emotions come into play. Um, so anybody that has ever had a probably even social conversation with me knows that I really just like to talk about systems. Um, so I took this slide um, because I think that we tend to get in our little silos and only think about what can we do immediately with the students that are in our classrooms, what can we do to support our colleagues, um, but really looking at how can, um, how can we make some systemic changes um, to support every student. Um, so first and foremost, as we've sort of said over and over again, really looking at how do we develop um, disciplinary literacy, how do we teach kids how to read, write, speak, and listen across all content areas, not just in your English class. Um, and then again, what um, Lauren was talking about, the vertical transcript analysis, that's something that's super fascinating to me, thinking about like if you were identified as an IELTS student in elementary school, what does that trajectory look like? Versus if you were identified as a student who needed RTI, what does that look like? And, how are, our, how are our special education students, like we know that kids kind of get locked out of courses or opportunities because of their special education services that are required and, and they really need them. So really looking at that um, and that kind of leads into this idea of the master schedule. Like if we look at that and we know that every kid that needed phonetic reading couldn't take Spanish, um, how can we look at our master schedule to adjust that so that we can meet the needs of every student? Um, again, discipline referral rates, um, the high school always ends up sort of holding the bag for this because that is where the data is, is reported about suspensions and dropout rates. Um, but really, one of the things we wanted to look at was what, what do those discipline referral rates look like? And what we found was that we couldn't really find out. Um, so finding out how can we track it and how are other districts doing this? Because that it's a, it's a, big, it's a big topic and um, sort of what Lauren was talking about, about that internal bias. How do you feel about being a student? And knowing that that can start in preschool. Um, and how do, we, how do we know who's feeling what way based on their behavior? You see behavior as communication. Um, again, looking at dropout rates. Um, what are the different pathways that exist? How can we learn from best practices off island? How do we engage our students before, we, before they drop out? Um, continuing to improve and increase our effectiveness in culturally competent counseling and social emotional learning. Um, I know as a, as a community, I'm very proud of um, the work we've done in this area. When I worked for an agency on the Cape, we had more bilingual um, therapists on Nantucket than on the rest of Cape Cod combined. So, um, you know, we deserve a lot of praise for that. Um, looking at how universal preschool can narrow the racial gap, um, and then really exploring the research about effective dual language programs. Um, at the high school graduation, I was so touched and impressed with the multilingual uh, feel of that um, and then just thinking about what a gift that is for kids that are multilingual um, and how do we provide again that opportunity as an opportunity as opposed to like sorry you, and I know it's hard but you got to do this um, so that's that was exciting for me So uh, these are really two of our big recommendations and they're staffing and obviously there's a budget, um, you know, impact to what we're recommending. But I will say that after the year that we've had, which is probably the toughest teaching year I've had in my 22 year career, um, the importance of this type of support that we're recommending cannot be underscored more. Um, the work that we recommend that the district undertakes, it, it requires staff. And um, the district leadership team and the teachers are all working very hard. Um, and I think we need to consider, um, you know, spending money where we need to spend it. And um, the DEI coordinator, Lauren's going to talk a little bit more about on the next slide, but is a, a district level leader who would lead the work that we're talking about. One of the things that, you know, we encountered as a, as a group of, of teacher leaders is um, that we did not have the time to dig into the things that we'd really love to dig into. Um, and we need someone who is committed to, to this work and whose job it is to commit to the work. We mentioned this in earlier slides, but instructional coaches who support teachers focus on differentiation of instruction and supporting students is so key to this work, especially I think in the next few years as we see people retiring, 
um, and we hire you know, new teachers, some of them who are coming in without any teaching background or just out of school. Um, coaching is such an important element of becoming a good teacher. It is not an easy job. Um, and we've seen with coaches that we currently have in the district um, some real successes. Um, so the instructional coaches, um, we believe, is a real bang for your buck. This is a flow chart that we kind of brainstormed of what um, a suggestion of what some of the responsibilities of a DEI coordinator um, would look like and kind of some of the information that um, he or she may receive would be from different system reviews as well as curriculum reviews um, and in collaboration <coughs> with the civil rights coordination. Um, we were hoping that they would work in partnership with uh, school committee, administrators, um, and community stakeholders and then be able to kind of dispense and share that information and recommendations with instructional coaches who could then share with teachers and then support staff. And I think um, time and time again, one of the things that we kind of kept discussing and we talked about this a lot last year is that it's so important too for this work to be um, kind of valued and embraced by not just the teachers and the teaching assistants, but kind of all of the district staff so that it's the same uh, language and perspective being used by the bus drivers, by the custodial staff, uh, by the, the grounds crew, um, really everybody that might have an interaction with um, staff members in the district, parents, uh, students that <clears throat> all kind of on the same page. <clears throat> um, and with the work of the, the work of what we did, it's very time intensive, it's very detail oriented. This is our second year, um, and even with the use of having an, a, a, even having a consultant um, and a, a bigger ILT this year, um, minimal minimal progress has has been made. Um, we've certainly had an impact, but certainly system wide, um, it's kind of been um, minimal. So, the work that is required certainly um, requires positional power um, and access to the ability to make to make system changes. Um, and this person could also do evaluations and lead professional development, um, debrief incidents with students, and there's some other recommendations that um, are gonna be shared next that the DEI coordinator could certainly help facilitate as well that we think would be um, really beneficial for future staff and <coughs> current uh, staff and students. So this leads us to the next steps for teacher leaders. Some of this would be building on the work we've already begun, and some of it would be supporting work in new arenas, culturally responsive student experiences, assemblies, book clubs, continuing to make a more cultural literacy night at NES, which we've already been gone, begun and has been to great success, um, that whole literacy week, making it more multicultural. Um, how can we do more inventory of classroom materials and making it more of a DEI lens? And then in terms of working with student and staff from historically marginalized groups, how can we support them? And in terms of also professional development opportunities, making recommendations for options and ways to examine inequities in education. I mean, we began this work this year and we had some really great professional development, but it'd be great to continue that and how we can even bolster it even further for our community as a whole. Just gonna add on. Um, so one of the, another thing that's made me really proud as a Nantucket Public Schools teacher is um, there's been clearly a very um, intentional effort at hiring, more diverse hiring practices. Um, and again, people who've had a casual conversation with me know that as much as that thrills me, there's a concern too, because if you don't have the systems in place to support diverse teachers, you're gonna lose them. Um, and that's really bad. So I think this idea of affinity groups um, for, to support staff from historically marginalized groups is really important um, and something that I think a DEI coordinator um, could really latch on to um, as far as having sort of a direct access to staff that may have a different experience as a teacher of color than as a white teacher. Um, and so I think really looking at how do we support our staff um, in that way. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be limited to um, people of color, but I think really being intentional about that. Um, I know I'd be always fascinated to be part of an allyship group on how, how to be a good ally. Um, so that is that on this, and I'm gonna take any questions you guys might have. After we look at this awesome picture of the, um, the author that came this year and a couple of high school seniors um, who were able to speak to her, 
um, and get her the book signed. It was it was a pretty impactful experience, I believe, for high school kids. Thank you so much, uh, Rocky. <laughs> you know. <laughs> a plus. Thank you. That's very, a first. Very thorough. <laughs> Girls. <laughs> um, I only have, I can't really tell you much. I appreciate all the work that went into it and just the, the hours that you don't even get paid for. This is a stipend position, so we are getting paid for them. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Thank you. Um, I only have one question. And, um, the shared monthly newsletter with the district staff, mm -hmm. um, what does that? What's in, what's in that? So um, really what that was was resources. Um, so if it was, um, help me out. The, the, so I'm going to have Lauren talk um, about this. This was her, her project yeah. last year. <laughs> so um, we did this last year. We worked as a um, team together. We would draft a monthly newsletter, and so we would think about what's the focus that we want to do for the month. Um, so we would try to have a theme each month. Um, you know, sometimes that was already done for us, like if there's Black History Month or um, Women's History Month or um, Asian and American um, Pacific Islander Awareness Month. So we would look at that and um, provide kind of an overview of what it was all about and then specific resources targeted at the different grade bands for if you wanted to infuse this either as a separate lesson or to something that you're already doing, this would be a great way to infuse that type of work. Here are some um, YouTube videos of read-alouds or different things that you could show, um, things like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Esmeralda. Um, no questions, just wanted to say wow. Um, kind of piggyback uh, Rocky's comment. Great job. Thank this you. Amazing. Thank you, Esmeralda. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with my colleagues. Um, it's beautiful. You've done so much work on this. I um, There's so much to say, and you all have really delved deeply into it. I, I did have one question, and this is just my, uh, for my edification, what does it really mean when the decolonizing the curriculum? I hear that a lot, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, because I'm unclear about it. So it's interesting because um, it was, it was a course we took last year, um, and so it really is about just sort of teaching the truth, the mm -hmm. whole truth, um, and not deleting parts of history that are hard to discuss, mm -hmm. um, and to really looking at teaching every student that's in front of you. Um, so some examples of things, like I always find it really validating when I take a class like this, I'm like, oh, like we're already doing uh, like a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So um, thinking about really just capturing student voice, right? Like if you think about the education system historically, I have a student who tells me every day, school was made to make factory workers. Every day he tells me that. I'm like you're not wrong, so how do we make that better for you? Mm -hmm. um, so really um, making education really interactive. And, and validating and, and celebrating the experience of, of our students that may have had a different <coughs> educational experience before they began here. Um, thinking about sort of how we tell the story. I, use, I always use Thanksgiving as the example because it's the story that we were all lied to our entire lives about um, and how do we scaffold kids from this understanding that they may have had or I know my, I had and so then how did I pass that down to my children as a parent mm -hmm. um, from that sort of like sweet story to the truth in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, and really, the other big thing was really capturing student voice. Like, if I say this all the time, if you look at students, if you listen to students, they will tell you what they need, mm -hmm. um, and they will they will tell you in a really unpalatable way. I promise you that. <laughs> Not all of them, but in general. Um, and so I think really capturing that idea, and and it's it's um, scaffolding from sort of the traditional ways that we may have been taught to teach, or taught as students, um, to ways that are just more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tim. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question. A term I've never seen before, a never L. What is mm -hmm. a never L? So a student who is multilingual but was never needing English language services. So a student who came into public school speaking more than one language and never needed to learn how to speak English because they were multilingual when they began. Right? Okay. <laughs> like, uh, so every student never that happened. checks um, <laughs> any other language on, at, uh, besides English on their home language survey will be screened by the district for their English language proficiency. So many of those students are multilingual, but they come in and they will score completely proficient, but they will still have that delineation of their bilingual multilingualism 
And so they're just considered never L, although they have multilingual mm -hmm. home life. Mm -hmm. So does, does, excuse me to the chair, does that mean if they are um, bilingual, if they speak two different um, forms of Spanish, but they don't speak English, is that what you're saying? No, no, no. Being bilingual, speak being bilingual English. doesn't mean, just because you're bilingual doesn't mean you have to speak English. No, bilingual no, means no, two no, different no, languages, correct? Correct. So, but in this case, these students could be, speak multilingual, I mean, they could speak Portuguese, Spanish, English, but their English is proficient to monolingual English speakers, so they never need English language services. Thank you. You're welcome. Did that answer your question, Dr. Lockwood? Okay. If I may, there is another category that we haven't really started delving into, and I know Nicole will know this, and that's not the et never L, but the ever L, which is another um, category that the state is starting to look more at, which are English learners that will never reach capacity and will always have a struggle with um, English as they, are, um, as they are learning and developing. So mm -hmm. that's another issue. We see students that remain um, in English <coughs> learner services for multiple years from elementary all the way through to high school. So there is another category that's being kind of fleshed out um, in, at the state level um, with that. As well. And I think that really relates <coughs> to this idea of the transcript review because mm -hmm. these, those are likely students who are duly identified as a student with a learning disability who is on an IEP and also um, learning English. Mm -hmm. And so looking at, you know, if you want to talk about locked out of choice, right, that is really it. If you need ESL services and you need special education services, that really limits your access to choice um, in our current system. So how do we look at prioritizing needs um, and providing that access um, for every child? Um, thank you. This has been a very interesting and, and thorough presentation. Um, and I thank you for taking on the work um, because it is important. And I, even though you say that you feel like perhaps you didn't get a lot done, that doesn't come across <laughs> tonight. Um, I would encourage you to continue. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're already looking at the discipline uh, rates and also breaking that down and classroom um, or students removed from their classroom, et cetera, because I think that that can tell us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the curriculum, do you see this group eventually making recommendations to add certain curriculum or certain topics that are mm -hmm. not currently being taught? I think potentially. Um, I think we, we don't, I think some of us have like inklings of, of where we think that what the data could show, but in order to like really make informed recommendations, we'd want to do more curriculum review, I think with writing specifically is what, um, just because of that's kind of where the MCAS data um, has led us. And mm -hmm. I think really looking at um, what types of populations does the curriculum that we currently have serve and who is being left out. Because as our student population has changed to be much more diverse, has our curriculum also changed to meet those needs? Mm -hmm. I, I also think it's more, for me, I think more about those instructional practices, right? Like the curriculum and the standards, those are, we, we have some choice in that, but not a whole lot of choice. So it's, I think more about how do you have culturally competent instructional practices so that you make sure you're engaging every student. How do you have materials that may still teach, that, that will still teach that same standard, um, but that are engaging for every student in the classroom mm -hmm. so that you're providing mirrors and windows for every child to see themselves and to, to see somebody else whose life might be so different than theirs. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I, so I, I see it more as instructional practices and materials than necessarily curriculum, but I think to, to what Lauren said, like we really need to, we need to know that. Like, that's my gut, but. And what can we enhance as to like what we're already doing, like where is there flexibility in existing scope and sequences to be able to provide some, um, you know, some modifications um, when, we, when we're already seeing students aren't making progress, where is there room for teachers then to be able to go back and reteach something in a different way or with different tier one supports, mm -hmm. different um, SCI supports, rather than just have, you know, feeling the pressure to continue going on and teaching, 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 teaching to get to the next unit. Mm -hmm. So as Paige alluded to earlier, I mean, this is a tremendous amount of work. And so kudos to you for being able to take on the extra hours um, already on a busy schedule. Remind me, is a D, D E I coordinator in our budget for? No, um, not for this year. 
one of, and I'll, you, you've heard me say this numerous times, but the, the, one of the challenges that we have in our budget planning is that it happens almost an entire year before it actually gets implemented. Right. We are planning our budget in October and November, and a lot of times we don't know yet what we need. So the, this recommendation will absolutely be part of our budget planning for FY24, mm -hmm. but it's not something that we are in the, in, in, uh, the ability, that we have the ability to implement in the next year. So we will have to plan this for the for the, the year following. Do you? And I'm not asking this to put you on the spot, but just for us to consider that um, again, we don't know what positions we're going to fill for the coming year. <laughs> I know we want. I know we've got our wish list, and some we we can't afford not to hire. But um, it, it would be important, I think, for us to be able to come back and revisit this as a as a conversation. Absolutely. Not wait until 2024, but if we if we've got the budget, you know, as we open up school or we see the possibility <laughs> to have the, to invite the team to come back and maybe we can certainly look. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I may, I just would like to thank this team. This is um, the work that they have done has been so important in guiding us, guiding me, guiding the leadership team in understanding where our work really needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we are on the right, we're in the right direction. We're heading in the right direction, so we, I don't want to lose the momentum. It may feel like it's slowing, or this year really kind of made it slow because it was a challenging year, but I feel that we are actually moving slowly forward. Mm -hmm. And I would love to, um, to continue the work um, you, but also perhaps new members. We may have, we're going to have a lot of new people next year, and there may be some folks who would be very interested in jumping in um, on, a, on a DEI ILT. <coughs> Excuse me. But I thank you for the work you've done over the last two years thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, moving on to the superintendent evaluation timeline. So this is much less of a presentation than it is about a discussion. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we have a specific timeline. Last week we had a, um, a workshop with Jim Hardy from MASC who discussed and, tr and helped um, kind of give a refresher and an yes. overview of the superintendent evaluation. So we do have on the books the um, July 26th meeting, which originally was going to be a retreat, but now we've moved it to a workshop so that I can present um, my evidence of um, to determine when and how quickly you want to move forward with the um, evaluation process mm -hmm. in um, having each of you um, go through the evaluation and then um, when you want to do that publicly. So um, we have a few dates set um, scheduled in August, but I just need to know um, through the chair um, what that's going to look like and when you would like to actually do that evaluation. So you had, oh yes, yeah, so this 26th, June 21st, July 26th is what we have for Beth, as she, says, mm. she just said, to provide us with the mm. evidence. I, I did put as a placeholder on August 23rd, if you look on the horizon, which is the last page, mm -hmm. um, you will see the school committee <laughs> workshop. I put it on as a, work, a possible workshop and that being a possible um, discussion, um, or that being the evaluation time, mm -hmm. is that, does that give you enough um, time between July 26th and August 23rd to complete your evaluation, which includes the subcommittee to write the evaluation and then um, do the public yeah. um, presentation. But give us a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say, I mean, we want, obviously want you to have that in hand before we start the next school year. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I, I feel that I could do that if you all do. Okay. Yeah. Is Morel here? Mm. Rocky? Yes, ma'am. Kim? Yes. Uh, but can the evaluation in public, should that be at a workshop meeting? Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, Jim said it is possible as long as it's at a public meeting, and a workshop is a public meeting. So. Uh, okay. by, by doing it at a workshop, it still allows anyone okay. to attend. It just means that no votes are taken on that. Right, we, yeah, right. We won't vote on it. That, that works with me. I, we haven't identified yet who will be the subcommittee to um, bring together the evaluations. 
So would anybody like to volunteer? I would. Yeah. Shall you and I work on it? Sure. Unless anybody else would like to work on it. How many do you need? Two. Well, if they have three, it's... <laughs> then we're in a then public a meeting. <laughs> so Perfect. <coughs> so are you all okay That's with That's fine. Tim? I'm not busy okay. in August. <laughs> okay. So then um, Tim and I will, will get together. So we'll... Once we've heard from Beth, you'll look at the documents that you were given by Jim. Mm -hmm. You'll fill out your individual forms, and then you will give them at that point, August... They should probably come to, uh, Katie doesn't start until. She, no, she's available starting mm. the 1st of July, so she can start oh, to collect yeah. okay. information after the um, the workshop on the 26th. So, so as soon mm. as you start to fill out your um, evaluation, I think Logan also has something to mention. Okay. So. But this is. <coughs> I put it in as a suggestion mm. simply because it's not a, the 23rd is not a, um, we don't have any votes to be taken on that day. Now, we could. Um, oh, that's the 19th. It is a standard Tuesday. We can, we can change that and make it. Please. <coughs> That makes sense. Thank you for the suggestion. Mm -hmm. So we could we could additionally add a workshop in between, if we wanted. It doesn't have to be on a Tuesday. It could be any day. So if that's and and um, and limit it to one item, if that's what we wanted to do. For a regular, regular. For a workshop, if you workshop. wanted the workshop okay. to be the superintendent evaluation, yeah. or you can make the twenty third a full, a full meeting. You can do it in a full meeting. <coughs> On the 23rd, what, are we good at doing that? <coughs> yeah, <coughs> unless okay. we feel that we would want to have, there's a compelling reason to have a neat meeting in between. Between the, between the month, <coughs> between mm -hmm. the 26th and the 23rd. Mm -hmm. I think through the chair, I agree with Logan, that seems like a long, that seems like a long time not to meet. Well, um, we're meeting on the 9th. August 9th is a, is a full meeting. Right, but in July, we wouldn't have a regular meeting, we would just have a workshop no. set. That's correct. So does the committee feel that it would be wise to have a full meeting um, in July? Uh, through the chair, I, I do. Is there <coughs> it, yes, it's a public meeting anyways. So. Right, but we can't take votes at the workshop, mm. so that would be a month that we would go possibly not being able to vote on any, if anything came up mm -hmm. or... I, I think we should... It a regular meeting okay I, I think we should do that if I may through the chair so the request is 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 for the August 23rd meeting to be a regular meeting yes. are you and we're someone also talking about adding an additional yeah. meeting in July in July okay yeah. so I in in our discussion there was a lot of challenging vacation schedules in July and I don't remember yeah. that we were, we were able to find a day so um, so Tell me how you, what you'd like to do. I mean, <coughs> I think we ought to look at July with one meeting is reasonable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we, we actually, we got one on the 9th. Of July? No, no August 9th. Oh, okay, August No, August 9th. At the moment, the only thing we have set is July 26th, and that is a workshop yeah. where no votes are taken. Uh, I'm unavailable. So what about the 5th of July? I'm unavailable. <laughs> All right. 19th of July? Sure. 19th of July, everybody? It's a Tuesday? Thursday, third Tuesday? Um, I think I can. Yeah. Laura, you're unavailable, if I remember correctly. Uh, through the chair, there's uh, not going to be a date where we're all going to be here. But at least the public will have access yeah. to what mm -hmm. we have to vote on. If some of the superintendents or uh, not super some of the superintendents, uh, principals or teachers can't make it, that's fine. But as long as we have 
right. a quorum we need for us to be and, and to get it out there because it, uh, God forbid something happens and we go, well, we can't have, have to have an emergency school committee meeting. Right. Does, thank you. Does the 19th work for you? I'm here. So is the 19th going to be a full school committee meeting? Yes. I, I think I can make it work. And the 26th would still then be a workshop. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Does that work? Works for me. Okay. 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 We need to vote. Mm -hmm. Take a vote on um, the timeline. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was just, I was still in my head about the 19th. Okay, so that's good. Thank you, everybody, for mm -hmm. going through that. So, um, moving on to the votes to be taken discussion. May I have uh, a motion to accept and approve the date and timeline of the superintendent's evaluation? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we will have um, July 19th is a full committee meeting at 6 p.m. And then we will have July 26th, which will be a workshop where the superintendent will present um, the evaluation evidence. We're gonna keep August 9th as a full committee meeting and August 23rd um, will remain as a workshop. Thank you. So we have a vote to approve the ESP collective bargaining agreement that is going from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2025. I just have a typo, of course, on there, <laughs> but may I have a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? Uh, the a typo just is on page two, um, recognizes, I think, the word the is missing uh, the association or the association for the purpose. I did not read the whole thing otherwise. <laughs> um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, vote approval for the new school committee clerk, Katie Bedell. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Vote to approve the donation from an anonymous donor for the Mead uh, Astro Telescope to the NHS Science Program for $300. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote to approve the donation grant from the Community Foundation for Nantucket and Remain Nantucket Fund to Nantucket Community School, 56 Center Street Programming for $40,000. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote to approve donation from Nantucket Education Trust to the Nantucket Community School for the Summer Boost Program of $2,500. Move approval. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> um, as previously discussed, may I have an approval for the 2022-2023 calendar draft number two? So moved. Move. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 May I have... Um, Approval, please, for the June 14th meeting minutes. I moved. If I, if I may, the um, June 14th minutes, I don't believe, are included. They will be moved to the next meeting. Oh. <coughs> okay, go ahead. The 7th. 7th. Okay, thank you. All right, so, yep, thank you. May I have uh, an approval, please, for the transfer and invoices? Move approval. Second. 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 Thank you. So you need All to go info. back and vote for the 7th. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Oh, we have to go back for the seventh. Okay, so uh, may I have an approval, please, for June seventh me minute meeting? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Subcommittee work. Anybody have any updates on subcommittees? Matt? I attended the Cape Cod Collaborative meeting, and uh, just to reinforce, they are also having labor shortages, and uh, in some cases, it's rather dire, so we're not alone, whether that's comforting or not, but mm. uh, so that was um, the week before last. I did actually um, 
meet with Paul Hilton mm. on a separate um, subject, and he was so appreciative of your contributions and also oh, from Zona's you. earlier uh, prior. So thank you for that. Thank you. Any other uh, negotiations were done, scholarships were done? Mm -hmm. Okay. No Catherine? No Catherine. So we've already, let's have a look at the agenda for next meeting. Uh, excuse me to the chair. When does the um, s um, student council representative um, join us? And is it mandatory or does it, do they just volunteer to be on it? They apply to okay. come through the school council and they apply to, for the position and mm -hmm. then the students vote on the student that gets the position. Okay, thank you. So if I'm yes, Mrs. B could you come to the uh, <coughs> microphone, please? <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that we do have a student representative. Um, it, it was voted on as um, a Mrs. Proch. Chair P Mrs. Proch. <laughs> <laughs> help you out. Trick question tonight. Um, it, it is going to be Natalie Mack. Um, I'm sure that she'll be um, joining um, as soon as possible. I'm not sure like when you would want her to be here, but if I have that date, I can help make sure that she's part of the meeting that you'd like to have her join. Yeah, I would Great. say by the beginning of school. I think we'll Thank give her the you. summer okay. off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'll make sure that she's at the first meeting that when would be school terrific. starts. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for letting us yeah. know. Thank you. Thank you. What, you couldn't have said that from up there? Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're all set for the mm. agenda. Okay, mm -hmm. Beth, would you like to? Yes, um, I would like to take a moment to um, recognize. Um, Mrs. Logan O'Connor, who has done such a remarkable job, not only as the school committee clerk, but as the, um, I can't even list all of the things that she does, executive assistant uh, to the superintendent, um, HR designee, uh, records access officer. Um, I really cannot match John Riccio, so you, st <laughs> <laughs> you, you said it so beautifully and eloquently, but um, I am, I am indebted to her in my early success as a superintendent here in Nantucket, and I cannot thank her enough for the support that she's provided to me, and I think the school committee is also feeling the same as I am. So I'm going to turn it over to, um, to uh, Vice Chair Proch to continue. What, excuse me, before Vice Chair Proch to the chairs, and <laughs> as a new school committee member, I can't thank you for your guidance. I can every Wednesday, I open my eyes and peek and see if there's an email from Logan O'Connor there. I'm like, please, God, no, 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 no. Um, I'm not sure who the Robert guy is, but he has a lot of rules, and I want to thank you for helping me get through those. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done the other year if it weren't for you. So, Mrs. O'Connor, we know how much you enjoy having the spotlight put on you, and as you're leaving, you know, you're just going to have to um, just be uncomfortable for a little while. Because on behalf of the school committee, I want to thank you for everything that you have done, not only for us as each individual, but also as a collective group. And you will be sorely missed. And we have um, a history of, of working together um, in a different capacity at, through the community school. And you have always been um, kind and uh, willing to help when people needed the extra help and, and to learn and, and learn the learning curve because there's a lot in this world of education and you come with a lot of experience and you've been able to keep us afloat at times when we've really needed it. So I'm extremely grateful. Um, the school committee did get together and I'm gonna ask you to come down here for a minute because you're gonna really love this. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Logan. <laughs> and I expect a smile on your face, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so many years ago, I attended the mask conference, and it was one of the occasions that Logan was not there. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to actually bring her something back 
from the conference, but I never gave it to you. So it's coming to you this time. This is a gift from your school committee to you. <laughs> it's a mask bag. It's just what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I might suggest that you open the bag. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I've had it for years. <laughs> Pretty good bag, actually. It, it is. Yeah, I think it's got the zipper. I really all get these. <laughs> I know it's. It's another bag. It's it is like another a bag. Box. A bag within a bag. Can't get the other one out. <laughs> they're a mask. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little. They're very, they're very, very pretty. I can't take the other one out. I can't make it work at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been, it's been a ride with school committee. Um, I, I, come to every meeting and I do all of the school committee that I do with two very important people that come to me every time, and that's Jenny Garneau and Robin Harvey, and I have their plaques in my drawer with all the rest of the stuff and the sculpture that I keep for school committee, and they're just there as a reminder of how important the work is that school committee does, how deeply invested they were. Um, the recording and all of those pieces came really because Jenny, long before the TV was happening and NCTV, she wanted it recorded because she felt it was so important. Um, I just, I, I just hope that everybody can continue to do the work because everybody's here for the children. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Break a leg. May I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So you've returned. Yeah. I feel like I have an elephant sitting on my chair. I think it's just. I think it's just.